Okay, thank you very much. I'm super delighted to be here. So I'm Jonas Kjellberg, um, serial entrepreneur, uh, author, investor. Um, as, as you heard, I had the, the great pleasure of actually being part of this little company called Skyper that later became Skype. Um, I'm also an investor. Um, I invested over 400 million euros into a little small company, shoe company called Salando. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but um, it actually became quite big. It's today listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Um, I was also the chairman of the board of a company called iCloud. I thought, you know, putting things in the cloud would be very important. Um, and that also became quite successful because I was mostly lucky because it was sold to um, Apple. I'm also today in the board of uh, the digital board of IKEA. As, and I have started more than 40, 50 companies in my life. Um, I started a company called Player.io, Nunuba, and Kennetworks. I sold all of them to Yahoo. So if you ever have a company that is not working out, call Yahoo. <laughs> because they buy nearly everything. And as you heard, my life has always been about changing the game. My passion is basically, when I get up, every morning is to try to understand how can I take a perfectly working business model and destroy it. That's my passion. So, but after I had the opportunity of selling Skype, my problem was basically most of my ventures actually never worked. So most of my ventures actually today still fail. Is that because I like failure? No. I hate failure. People say you should embrace it. I really hate it. The thing is, I like taking risk. And I was quite puzzled, still am, why do some companies succeed and why do some not? So after Skype, I had the opportunity to go to Stanford and started teaching. If you ever have time in your life, go to Stanford. It's a great place. And I did. But after a while, my professor, Tom Kosnick, he came up to me and said, Jonas, it's great that you're here. You know, the students love you. There's only one little challenge. And that is, we've noticed you haven't read the books that you're teaching about. OK, fair point. Uh, I don't know how many here have read the American management literature. But if you haven't, most of these books are actually shit boring. So I said to Tom, why don't we do something different? Why don't we write a book about all your research at Harvard and publish it? Now you've been here at Stanford, been at the pinnacle starting company. He said, that's a great idea. And we did. But I said, if we're going to do it, I want to do it my way. So I said, let's launch a book that is 100 pages long, and half has to be pictures. He was not utterly convinced, I'll tell you that. I said, let's do it anyway. I think this is what the world needs. And then we were super proud when we had our first copies. And we sent it to his former colleagues at Harvard. What do you think they said? Ah, oh, this is so sweet, Tom. Have you done a children's book? <laughs> and he was totally devastated. He said, Jonas, we have to cancel it. You know, it's my reputation. It will never fly. And I said, Tom, who cares about you know, a bunch of Harvard professors? Let's talk to the real guys, the publishers of the world. So I spent a lot of time talking to the big publishers. What do you think they said when they saw this book? Well, what they said is, Kjellberg, the children's department is down the hall. And no one actually wanted to publish the book. I even got formal letters sent home to me. Dear Mr. Kjellberg, we wish you great success somewhere else. So I said, OK, I started a lot of companies. How hard can it be to actually publish a book? You print it on paper and start selling it. And since I was pissed with the whole industry, I went back and I wrote another book. And this book has only pictures. So now there's a third book published by Wiley, one of the most prestigious publishing houses in the world. Why would they publish my book? Well, I think the simple perspective is it's sold. 
And that's the perspective of how you need to run companies. So what's the book about? I think the book is about the nine different gears that you as an entrepreneur need to run if you're a successful perspective. And in the center part here, which people don't talk a lot about, is basically customer acquisition. Because let's face it, if you want to be and run a successful company, you need to innovate in customer acquisitions. No customers, no fun. This is the secret source of all the successful companies I've been part of, unlocking the innovation of driving new customers through the door. And all the most successful companies have actually done it. So that's the first learning. Second learning, you need to delight your user. You need to build the best product in the world. It's that simple. We've taken this from the hierarchy of customer needs. It basically works like this. At the top you have delight, then you have efficiency, and then you have functionality. How many here know Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Okay, cool. Basically works the same way. You know, in the top you have delight, and in the bottom you have functionality. I can give you an example. Um, this company had a very, very strong delight. What was it? Safety. The challenge here is, during a period of time, they actually increased the number of safety features and their customer satisfaction and delight increased. But what do you think happens when all cars are as safe? Correct. It becomes a functionality. And the Swedish engineers couldn't figure it out because they kept on doing safety features. It actually ended up that the company went into chapter 11, was bought by the Chinese. The Chinese came back with a new delight, which was basically Scandinavian design. And the company is doing OK. So if I want to urge you, as entrepreneur, as leaders is to really think about how do I innovate in tomorrow's delight? Because tomorrow's delight will be what is acquainted by you. <clears throat> and I spend a lot of time with you know, senior leadership in most of the biggest companies today. But I'm still fascinated how much time and energy they spend on trying to unlock and work with functionality and efficiency when they should be spending most of their time rethinking the company's delight of tomorrow. So basically, what is that friction-free storytelling that you need to tell your customers and employees? Because in the end, nailing that delight is the utmost important. It's a very simple question, what are you selling? I'm still amazed how often these large companies can't actually answer it. And a good example of a company that had a very strong delight, but it took him a very long time, was that I had the, chairman, I had the founder of H&M, Stefan Passion, in my board. Uh, he talked to me about how it took him enormous, it took him nearly 10 years to figure out H&M's delight, until he one day woke up and decided, from today on, we're going to be a fashion company with a zero less on the price tag. And the interesting thing here is that if this is H&M's stock price, it's been doing, success, been doing super successful. But there's another company that started a bit later that outgrew them. Which one? Sara, correct, even faster. Their delight is basically saying that they're not a fashion company, they're a logistic company. When H&M was all about trying to understand how to minimize costs for supply chain, they said, no, let's increase the cost so we can actually have things that we see on the runway in New York, we can have in stores in three weeks. So they rethought the whole fashion industry by defining themselves as a logistic company. They're first with the latest, that's their delight. Then I invested 400 million euros into this fashion company, Salando. It's, it's called Namshi here. And um, 
They dress cold. That's their delight. And when I was in the board, I often complained because I thought everything on the site looked so unproportionally ugly in the beginning. And I said, you know, we're a fashion company. We maybe should, you know, really rethink this. And then the head of fashion, she was from BCG, she just looked at me and said, Jonas, never ever underestimate the bad taste of Germans. Because for her, everything was just about data and analytics. It was all about trying to predict what are you going to buy. So it was a data analytic play. So I talked about two of the most important things. One is growth, customer acquisition. The second one is product market fit. The hard part and the last part of this is basically a business model. You need to rethink how you can actually do things. And this is how we started my life at Skype. You know, um, I had the great opportunity of being there very early on. But when I started, you know, we said, OK, how do we price this service? You know, what's the delight in a telco service? So we said, OK. And I said, OK, let's just do a benchmark and say, what have, how have the prices gone down during the last couple of years? And I said, OK, if we're students, we, we do our maths. Prices are going to continue to drop. So I said, why don't we make it to zero directly? And everyone was like, brilliant, you idiot. <laughs> how are we going to make money? And I'm like, ah, I haven't figured that one out yet. Like, who brought this idiot along? <laughs> and then Nicola said, you know, but maybe if that's going to happen, what do we need to do to rethink everything? So we started the innovation in zero game. Because if we wanted to offer Skype for free, we needed to rethink the whole cost structure. So we started that zero game. So we just set up you know, two columns. If this is a telco, and this was Skype, a telco loves to invest in infrastructure. We said at Skype, let's use the internet that you've already purchased. We found our first zero. The telco loves to invest in infrastructure when it comes to switches, Ericsson switches. The interesting thing here is that the personal computer and the CPU power was actually the same. So we said, let's code the calls in the computer, and we found another zero. To get good voice quality of voice over IP, you would actually need to rack a lot of Cisco routers around the world. By the way, how many here use Skype? Oh, cool, that's really cool. Uh, how many used Skype before Microsoft destroyed the product? <laughs> that's a lot of people as well. Can you remember when, in the early days, when you had your Skype client on? You went away, had some good internet, left the computer on, came back three hours later, and your computer was super hot, and the fan was blowing at max. Yes, I can see you nodding. Yes, because if that happened, your computer had become a super node, and all traffic was routed through your computer. Because we came to the conclusion there was a lot of CPU power connected to the internet, but not being used. So we said, you know, we're good guys. We'll just borrow your computer when you're not using it. And we found another zero. Customer service could be a very expensive cost for a lot of um, telcos. My challenge here is I was often more pissed after I talked to customer service than before. So if that's the case, we said at Skype, let's make it impossible to call Skype. Let's just take away our phone numbers. Let's make it impossible to reach us. Don't like it? Uninstall it. What we didn't really realize at that point in time is that there is a positive side effect to this, is that no regulatory company in the world could actually call us either. So that actually worked out in our benefit. So we found another zero. Marketing, super important. 
Telcos lo spend a lot of money on this. We said, how do we do this? We don't have any money at all. So we thought, what happens if we make a little recommendation button that pops up after you've talked for some good calls? And if you click that button, we went in, and since it was a downloadable client, we went in and we opened your Outlook. And we sent the mail to everyone in your Outlook. We sent quite a lot of mails. So we had zero cost for marketing. So, based on that perspective, then you can say, okay, interesting, but if you go to some of the most successful companies in the world, they've all innovated in zeros on the cost side. So if you're an entrepreneur, it's all about rethinking the cost structure of the company. What other companies have done this really well? Facebook, no cost for journalism. Uber, no cost for drivers, taxis. Google, no cost for content. Every night they actually Google the web and then they sell advertising on it. Airbnb. So if you want to be super successful rethinking things, it's these three things. Customer acquisition, rethink it, build the best product in the world, and innovate in zeros when it comes to the cost structures. Three simple things as an entrepreneur. That was a very, very short perspective for me trying to fit everything in. Thank you very much for me.